Jose, how you doing, man? Very good, brother. How you doing? I'm doing well. Man, uh, so initially, right, like, if, if let the audience know, uh, your dad came up on my list, you know, uh, of like, like, came across my plate. I was like, oh, man, I would, I would really love to talk to him because he wrote a book called The Four Agreements, right? And then that book changed my life a little bit. Uh, I, you don't know this, you're about to find it out now. Every morning when I wake up, like I do my, I do my, my breathing, I have my gratitude time. And then I always make the four agreements every day, you know? Um, and just to let everybody know the four agreements, you be impeccable with your word, uh, take nothing personally, make no assumptions and always do your best. So uh, these agreements changed my life and he's your dad. So I, I'm assuming that it changed your life too. Tell me what it was like. Tell me what it was like. Tell me what, tell me what you're all about, first of all. And then we'll like get into like your work. Yes, uh, I'm very grateful for this work that my family did. It totally changed the point of view of how we live life. And uh, one of the interesting things, when I first read this book, I, I said to father, I know this information. He puts a big on his face. He said, of course, you know it. Everyone knows it because it's integrity, talking to integrity. Now, this, when I read this book, I felt like this is simple. These agreements are so easy to master. One month later, I go to him and says, these agreements are so difficult. And he goes, well, the agreements, those are easy. The agreements that you made in your life, those are the difficult ones. And those are the tasks that you need to break. So those are the, the challenging ones. Explain that more. What do you mean the agreements that you made in your life are the difficult ones? Let's say, you know, let's say I'm, I'm programmed to take everything personal. Even as a little kid, you know, in the neighborhood, we, we look for people looking at us to ask them, what are you looking at, you know? And it becomes a little programming there. So it's a lot of attachment. So the moment that we begin being aware that these things are hurting us, it prefers is denial. And that was the most things of the uh, feeling detaching of my ideas, because who am I without, without these ideas of me being less than or me being like everybody else that I don't take responsibility. But when it was in my face and I know this, I cannot fool myself anymore. So we take attachment, like to detach from things. It's so hard, right? Yeah. Like things happen in your life. At, uh, people are mean to you, people, right? Like, like these, these things happen to all of us, right? So yep. where, where, take me through like this process. Like, I mean, the, like, I agree. The agreements are amazing and they're so simple. But I mean, like, you know, I yelled at my friends last week. Right. Because I, and so I wasn't being impeccable with my word. And um, I mean, I broke them all, all in one conversation, right? I wasn't being impeccable with my word because I was taking something very personally. I was also making assumptions about what somebody else was doing. And then I was an asshole. So that's not my best. Yes. And, and if it, this is a good thing to come up because there's awareness before there would not be awareness. And many mm -hmm. people do these acts without being aware or responsible or owning them. Now that we practice these agreements, yeah, we may cross the line, we may do negative things, but the moment that we begin being aware, we get uh, uh, confronted by our ally that we've been betraying all our life. And this is our, our consciousness. When we betray our consciousness, it's the key that we take excuse for everything we do. But now when we're stuck in the middle and it doesn't feel good, then it's like being in ghost town saying, I don't belong this way. This language doesn't belong to me anymore. And I'm tired of hurting people. Then they forgive me and then hurting them. You know, at this point, it becomes pointless. So in that moment, everything that one believes, it disappears. Now the scary part is to recreate a new dream. Okay, so how do we recreate a new dream? That's intent and action, you know? Many times, you know, life beat us, they put us down, and then it programs to do it to ourselves. And the moment that we wake up knowing that we take the responsibility, we're not blaming anything anymore because we can be so intelligent that we can create a justification, any excuse to convince others. You know, like if it was a corrupt lawyer, know that the person is guilty. I mean, it's not guilty, but he wants to do everything in his power to not lose, to make the person feel guilty. So in this one, we're misusing the word. But when we begin being aware that we're our own sabotager, creating a new dream for us, it's really easy because we want to do it. The problem is when we don't want to do it. What do you mean when we don't want to do it? Don't we all want to do it? Well, it comes a moment that we say, yes, you know, it's like the person who gave up alcohol because he did something bad and the next day, I'm never going to drink again, but he doesn't really want to do it or just guilt and shame to not be judged by itself. But when he really wants to do something that hurt its integrity and its family, 
it doesn't want to go to that way, it changes a point of view because he's not playing games mentally anymore, or you do it or don't do. And this is what separates us from the sleeping because we are aware consciously that we cannot betray ourselves anymore. That in the past, you know, we get enabled, people forgive us, we do it again, and this is a dream. But when we take responsibility, it changes the court. So how do you take responsibility, right? Like, like what, what, what are some steps that people can do to start taking responsibility, right? Because I mean, it's so hard. Yeah, right? but the it's simple so thing difficult. is the, the, the first thing is honesty. Because okay. if you're not honest, you're not aware what is affecting you or, change, or, or, or you want to change, you're not aware. But the moment that you are honest with yourself, you have an epiphany. Now that moment, it is now the work of discipline, you know? And this is the moment of many people are afraid of because laziness or mental blocks happiness to not train, to not push the body, to not push the mind, to not push whatever we can do. That in a moment that we get comfortable in an island of safety and a pain that we're used to, a self-doubt, but it comes a moment and you say, hey, this life isn't for me, especially if one lives in a business relationship and says, you know, this is eating me alive. This is taking my inspiration away, you know, and, and it's not about religion. It's about living. And this is not leaving. So in that moment, you know what's good for you and you know what's not good for you, but nobody will know. That's when the consciousness that you do it for the love of your life. And many times we think that the love of our life is outside of us, but this body, this is the love of our life because it's taking everything for us. It's so loyal to us. The question is, when are we going to be loyal back? And that's when everything changes. Okay, keep going. So be loyal back. What is that? So you have to be honest. What's next? Well, this is the transformation, taking action. It's like, don't go, walking or, don't go walking away from Medusa and then turn around and turn you into stone. The moment that you make a decision, you walk away from that dream and it's not bypassing. It's having the realization of something is not good for you. So what I'm saying right now, it could be plural in many ways of dreaming, but the important thing is taking the action because if we don't take the action, there will be no transformation. And it will be like my brother teaches saying, you know, you can read the whole cookbook, you can memorize it, but if you never get in the kitchen, you will never know what it tastes like. <laughs> All right. How do I get in the kitchen, man? Well, get the ingredients I want once. And that's the beautiful thing about many times people fed us food that we like, and many times they fed us food that we didn't like. But when we're in our own kitchen, which is the mind, the words are the ingredients, the stories are the ingredients. Now we know that everything in that is a story. And the principal thing is to change the storyteller. So almost like separating a little bit, like se separating your consciousness a little bit from you and who, right, right. Ex explain that a little bit because like you, you're, you're talking about it, but, but people have a, have, a, have a hard time with I am not my thoughts, right? Or well, I am. Say, a, go, let's go let's say we have an out of body experience. And many people think that it's sleeping, parasit paralysis. We plot and look around and see our body dreaming. No, that's just a dream. And after about the experience is when you realize that there's more than life than everything we're seeing. Right. And then we see that we see ourselves dreaming. We see ourselves automatically doing it. We see ourselves creating this, you know, this nightmare, this masterpiece of art. But the moment that we step in, it's like taking the kitchen back and getting our words back. So what? do create stories words create the stories what create the world of the gods the world of belief war that the words created so that's the important thing about being impeccable with a word because this is the world that fights with wars with words and you can see everybody wants to be right but at the same time knowledge is being corrupt that is using us instead of us using knowledge and this is when everything begins to change right when so we we're, not let we're in a hard time right now right because every because we have this this play on words that happens, mm -hmm. right? Where like, you know, you're not quite wrong, but you're not, you're not all the way right either. You know, our media does it, all these things like, they, like, you know, especially with COVID right now, there, there's not a lot of impeccability with, with the word going on. H how, how do you see that? How do you see how we as a society become more impeccable with the word? Because it doesn't look like it's happening anytime soon. Yes, and, I, and you were talking about knowledge, right? Like you have people just not believing things. Yes, like and, very and, simple and, facts. And, and many people they live in their little tribes of belief systems, and there's so many different belief systems that they have to be right. But in order to enter the world of everybody's trying to convince you, convert you, you walk with skepticism. 
You don't believe them. You don't believe yourself, but you learn how to listen. And why do I mean not believe ourselves? Because we may take sides of what's convenient for us or sides with our family or race, whatever. But the moment that we see the whole picture, we see, you know, the, the, the whole nightmare that the world's not being impeccable because people, they don't trust. They don't trust themselves. They trust others. And of course, they're going to be very, very greedy, be very selfish. The world can be ending, the stiffness. But when we wake up knowing that the negativity has been there from the beginning, at the contrary now, we're seeing even clearer before we didn't even see what's going on. And now with the power of internet, the power of science, you know, people cannot manipulate as they used to be before. So I believe that we're getting better as, as a society, as humanity, because we're identifying the lies now, the lies still surviving. It still wants to survive and it will do everything in its power to, to be right, even though it's wrong. And we can see the interesting thing, a dream is losing its power. It's like when you get into the last level of a video game, let's say when we were kids, you know, the video game was calm, the bosses were, were calm too, but at the la last level, it becomes so crazy. It's because it's like a chicken running without a head. It's been identified, it's wounded now. Now he really wants to, so the important thing about this is to respect our homes, live to truthfully in our homes, in integrity, because the integrity is intent in action. So no matter what they're dreaming outside of our home, inside of our home, we're creating this energy. Now, when we walk outside of our home, we're bringing whatever we have in our hearts, in our minds, our acts, we're taking it everywhere we go. And that's what we have to offer. So this is the most interesting thing about the world right now. What are we offering to the world? You know, some people say they're offering positivity and goodness, but when they go back home, when they go back, it does, it's a pretty mask, you know? So right now, the little ones are calling, you know, BS on everything, on all the religions, on all the politicians, on all the, the media, the social media, the entertainment, because it's something that's being grown, that something doesn't want to lose its power. And when we see with power of love, we can totally see that that person cannot survive. So you're talking about some big concepts here, right? You were talking a second ago about like, uh, you know, the, the lie has always been there and we can see that, you know, and we can trace that back. And this, this touches on the subject of religions here, you know, and kind of all inclusive with, 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 with what it seems like you do. And we'll get into it in, in a little bit. It, it touches on religions. Where, where are your, where's your stance on religions? Like what, how do you feel about, about them and about their validity and, 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 you know, like, and their use in the world today? Well, first of all, it's a beautiful story that got corrupted by greed and power. And every religion has two faces, evil and goodness, because it's just something that was created as a society to stop the addiction of suffering in every culture. But now, because it's power, it's money, and, and it's just a living giant, you know, and it's not even our own. It's our grandparents, their grandparents. It's not even our, our tradition. So when I see it, I see it like a dream. What good can I take out of it? And then I don't come from those religions. Somebody comes from those religions that I can speak to as a philosopher and philosopher, also artist and artist. And, and it's my job to get whatever I can, goodness to wherever I come from. And, and, and they go to their religion and they can clean up whatever corruption there it is because there's a lot of corruption in religion that many people cannot even stand to see the beauty in it because they are voting into battle and they want to run away. But the moment that, you know, we cannot run away from ourselves. We can run away from many things. And uh, in the running away, I, I tested many religions to see what was true, what was wrong. And you know what I saw? I said, forget the doctrine, forget the sermon. I began seeing how people live, how cultures treated women, children, how they treated each other. And then it's when I found out this is the realness. This is the real, this is the, 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 and, the, and then the devotion they have for the earth, for the plants. And then you can see the blind faith religion that they don't want to change. Everything is just a band-aid. They don't even have faith in the gods that they will put their God to fight another God in order to be right. But when you see the beauty of all the religions, you see what's behind it and that's the intent because it's just a way of life to let go of the addiction of suffering, which is the biggest corruption or let's say virus in the program of humanity in the world. Sure, this is, this is I mean, this, for me, this is what the four agreements, it, it, it helps me alleviate suffering in my life. 
right? So, and this is uh, of all of the things that we have com in common, um, me and you, right? We've been on 15 minutes now, right? Uh, I guarantee you that, and we don't know what else we have in common. We might have a lot of things in common, but we both know that we've suffered, right? Yes. It, it is part of the human experience. So what, do, how, how, do you, how do you deal with suffering? Like, uh, you know, your parents die, your grandparents die, you know, it's possible. Do you have kids? No. Okay. But, you know, like for me, for example, my kids might die before me. And man, this would be great suffering, like immense amounts of suffering. How, how, what is your perspective on dealing with suffering? Well, first of all, is that there's two types of suffering. The mind one, the dreaming one, and then the, 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 the body one. And the, the body one is the one that has PTSD, that has anxiety, that it becomes a, an, abu an abuse energy by the mind. Let's say something happened to me 20 years ago, and I re resurrect that thought in my head. Now I'm, my body is paying the price for the war that I'm resurrecting right here. So in there, all of that journey of 43 now that I have made it to this far, I noticed that when I have emotions, fear, love, anger, um, and any kind of emotion is my body speaking to me. I have no right to shut it up. Now I begin listening to my body and I can hear myself creating the story. So anything that I do, the story is not real, but the emotion, it is real. But the story that might happen that I'm projecting out there is not real. I will know when it's happening. Now I can understand the pain that it would be to lose a loved one because it happened before. And I went the other way around because I used their death to hurt myself until I get realized, could you imagine if I have all these ancestors inside of me, like they say in the shaman tradition, and I'm punishing them to see how I live. And I'm punished it's, it's a living hell of my elders inside my head. Explain that to me for a second. Like all the shaman living with you, go ahead. Can you explain yes, that there, a little more? There is a saying, uh, a metaphor saying that we have 3,000 ancestors walking behind of us and inside of us. But could you imagine that if I am using my body, I'm tormenting all my ancestors. So it is a responsibility to teach the little ones how to accept that. And it is a natural part of happening. And when I begin seeing my father dying when he had a heart attack, I took that as the greatest opportunity because that's the ultimate victim point of view. My father died, I have to suffer. And I was crying in front of him. And, and he said to me, is that the way you're gonna celebrate the death of your father's son? Get out of this room and fix yourself. And I was expecting it's gonna be okay. Everything's gonna happen. But when I came back, it's because I said, I'm disrespecting this person because I'm, I'm hurting myself with his death and I'm not even dead yet. And I'm beginning, I thank God that he stopped me in my tracks. And when I know that, you know, because one month before this happened to him, I, 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 I tried to commit suicide, but I, I was not successful. So the ultimate thing I could do, he teach me how to forgive myself. So I felt like everything was ready. But when I was in the hospital waiting for him outside the room, I said to myself, what if it was me who died and my father doesn't want to write books anymore, doesn't want to talk to people anymore? If I could speak to him, what it would be? Hey, son, you are alive. Hey, father, you are alive. You're not dead yet. I'm okay. You're in a place. Don't hurt yourself with my daddy. In that moment, it's like I didn't have time to waste. And I grabbed his hand. And I said, I'm with you now, pops. And he goes, good. Welcome back home again. Because this was another opportunity that I used to hurt myself and separate myself from, you know, integrity. So in that moment, I asked him, how can I repay you everything you teach me? And he said, okay, if you really want to know, help me to change the world inside your head. Every time you say you're not good enough, you're meant to love, or something happens outside of you, promise me that you will not hurt my son for whatever happens to you. In that moment, my reality of victim changed. And it was now the point of view of gratitude. How and old then were you I, at this point? I was probably like 23 or 24 years old. And when your dad had the heart attack? Yeah, I was 22. Okay. And when did you try to commit suicide? When I was 21. Okay. What was, what was going on? Why? Well... well I lived a whole life since I was 13, 12 in addiction. I, I got into crystal meth when I was 15 and many things happened in that world that when I had a few death experience, I wanted to leave. So I went to get married thinking that that would be the perfect dream, letting an old dream have married, have children. Well, I couldn't do it that because I still have dealing with myself. 
So in that moment, I went cold Turkey for like two years. But when I had um, marriage problems, it's just like I lost it because I wasn't mad at my partner. I was mad at life because I was trying to change my life. And in that moment, I relapsed. I drank a lot of champagne, I think it was. And I, the, 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 the marble snapped. And in that moment, I, didn't, I was mad at God and I didn't want to live. I got, I got a steak knife and punctured myself twice in the stomach. And I, I was a little chubbier than I am now that it was like this main from the main artery. But in that moment, brother, I began seeing all the negativity, all the damage that I have done. I was ready to go that even when I passed out and I opened my eyes, there was this white sheet above me and I thought I was dead. I was thought I was listening until someone uh, sneezed and I said, I sound tight. And but then I, right there, it was the ultimate thing because I was alive. I was feeling this weird sensation. Now the interesting part happened when my father came to visit me the same, the next day. And can he I asked you, me- Can I ask you a question? Yes. Had you grown up with all of this philosophy? Oh yeah. So, you, so your dad had been teaching you all this stuff and it, it, you know, through childhood it went bad. Yeah, and if it wasn't for that, it was resistant. And I tell you why I went through that direction. Yeah. I wanted to grow up fast. I was 11, 12 years old. So in my neighborhood, uh, kids grew, kids hang up in the corner and drink, my cousins drink. So I wanted to grow up fast. Where, where, where was this? Was this in Salt Lake City or where were you? Uh, in Tijuana, Mexico. Tijuana, okay. Yes, so I, I grew up I grew up there. So I wanted to grow up so fast and you know, like any other kids at the age of 13, 12, 15, we're doing things we're not supposed to be doing, hanging with things we're not supposed to. Be. And then it was total, total lost, but I was completely resisting. But at the same time, I was listening. It's like something inside of me knew that I was gonna be following this path. But you know, if I wouldn't touch the darkness, I would be just a parrot. We're scared of that darkness though, man. That darkness is scary, right? Like we, we, we put band-aids and barriers up around it and we, we hide from it and we run from it. That darkness, that darkness is a scary place to be in. Like it's not yeah. comfortable. And I tell you, many people will relate to this because this is darkness that we are scared of but it's what made us. It's like yeah. a seed that gets put into darkness but it comes out but it never comes out of darkness. So in my life, in my training, there's always been that epiphany, but Mother Nature says, where are you going? You're going back to the underworld again. You come back with more epiphanies, then life gets you back again to the underworld. And at one point, I believe that we can take it, brother. But when we come out of the darkness now, we bring medicine. And I wouldn't brought the medicine that I gave to myself. And because I gave it to myself, I give it to many people. And I feel like this was why this work is being translated more than 40 different languages, different religions, is because it really taps into the addiction of suffering into our complaining, the corruption of the word. And like I was saying earlier, when I was speaking to my father after I was recovering from that attempt, my father asked me, why do you do it? So he started getting me angry. He started getting me, teasing me and, and says, it's because you were stupid. And I go, I'm not stupid. And then I found myself defending all the things that made me how to do it. All the stories, I was defending them. Even though I almost took my life with them, I was still defending until he said these words to me, I forgive you the moment that you did that to yourself. Can you forgive yourself? And that was the, the point. Forgiving oneself is not about the story. It's about the act of betrayal. It could be in many different aspects, but it will taste the same. So in the Totec tradition, there's nothing to learn but unlearn. And this is when I hit that point in my life, when I was 23, I was ready to unlearn because before that, I wasn't aware of what I wanted to change. I was running away. But now I know what I wanted to. So this is what I said earlier in the program. When you get consciousness, there's no more fooling yourself. You, you cannot go back in ghost town because it's flavorless. Tell me more about the work. So, you know, we've talked a little bit about the word. What, what else entails the work, like the work that you help people with? Well, the work medicine, the work is medicine. And it may feel like the work, the medicine is for other people that I talk and help. No, they're helping me by being there, by being for themselves. I show up at the right time at the right moment. And, and the more things that come up, I knew why I went through things. Even if I went through something three weeks ago, you know, and then I don't know why I went through it. And then two days later, I met somebody who's going through the same things. It's, it's amazing. And this is the thing about life that we all have medicine to give to people who are out there who want to be, you know, 
who want to be singers, who want to be artists, who want to be entertainers, who want to be medical, is to really not sacrifice for other people if you want to do that, is that you want, really want to do that. And when you have somebody who has that passion for what you love to do too, it's like you look up and you know that everything you went in life for is to train the little ones and it's getting better. So what are the other stages of the work, right? So we, we talked about the word, right? Um, yes. Taking things personally, right? That's I the mean, big one. You know, yeah. that's, that's the big one because we take everything personal because we're ready to fight. And, and, and the thing about fighting or, what, or, or debating or whatever it is, is, is the opposite of peace. And we have to feel giant. We have to feel bigger. We have to have last words sometimes. But that's all in the in the uh, machista, machista world that has been contaminated. And what I mean by that is that, you know, it's the cold hearted, the, the, the stuff mind that is not caring. And the moment that we take this away from the little minds, the minds can be growing up to be trusting. So the impeccability of the word, really it is not taking yourself personally because you're not using the word again to hurt yourself and it's a, it's a doozy because it, it, it is so many temptations that happen every day. But at one point, is to not be afraid of these temptations. It's to expect them. What temptations? Whatever it is that you use to hurt yourself in life that happen outside. We, not, we cannot control the world. It's like saying to somebody, hey, my, my, my kid's going with us today. He's afraid of this. Don't mention this to him. Okay? Okay. And, you know, we, when we grow up, we're not kids anymore. We can look at that, whatever scares us. And, and we find out that fear is our biggest ally that we have always been afraid of is the big monster. But fear deserves the respect because it let us know what we're going. And now when we take things personal, we're really afraid of our own beast. Yeah, man. So, you know, I, like, especially this one, like, you know, assumptions my kids don't get yet. Right. And, and being impeccable with my word, with your word, they're kids. Right. But I really try this. Don't take it personal. But, you know, when they start to get mad, because anytime we get mad, it's just because we're taking it personally. Right. So how, how do we give, give, give me some better tools to help my kids not take things personally? Right. Like, I mean, I have an eight year old and, and, uh, and an 11, almost 12 year old. So I don't have old kids. Like they're little, they're young. What are, what are the steps that we take to help this, this generation, this younger generation learn how to, you know, you know, almost detach, right? Like, okay, this happened, but it didn't happen to me. It happened for me and, and, and not to take it in such a harmful way. Yes. The, 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 the first thing is to understand their language, to understand how they speak and how they use the word. And now the challenging part is how to translate our language that we speak every day into their own words that they can understand okay. because it's in their own words that they will have an epiphany one or three days from now because they will have the, the light bulb hit in. Now it's a mastery to see what are they, our, our hook is like a mama jaguar who sees the cops. They know their automatics, they know their routines and it's in the routines where the, the, the teaching begins to be put in because sometimes even parents set up their kids for failure to take it personal because they say you have to win you have to be the best and when they they don't win they feel so afraid and they feel like they're going to get in trouble or they they begin sabotaging but to really understanding that everything it's a game and it's fun even even you know succeeding in life it hasn't had to be that serious or that impact that we don't have to take it personal if we fall mistakes because the best things at everything, the best people who do at everything is the people who admit their mistakes because they don't sacrifice or the punishments of they even take it to the next level. So every kid is different, but the beautiful thing is to really understand their language. How do you deal with someone that has trauma, right? Because there, there are like, and in, 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 from my perspective, we kind of overuse this word a little bit trauma, right? Like I, I do yeah. like everything, everything you could say is trauma that has had every experience is trauma, but there are people that have had real trauma and for them to let go of their fear and not take it personally. And then not, not to make assumptions about what's going to happen the next time that a similar situation comes when you've had real trauma, like the PTSD, man, it, it's really hard. Yeah. And the thing is respect, what do you respect. Mean respect. If there's an abuse, an abuse puppy, you have to respect it to come to you. 
You have to let it be on their own, but you're still there for that person, for the puppy. But the person, it is also, as the puppy, it's wounded, it's ready to bite. So it has limitation of where it can let you in or why it cannot let you in. The important thing is to be there with that person that you love, listen to them, don't push them too much. But, and they will little by little reveal, reveal, and, but they first have to have trust in somebody so they can have trust in themselves. And I tell you, one of the things that I learned from my nervous system, because I, learned, I live with you know, panic attacks, I live with nervous system because of what things, they don't go away. But how I deal with them, it it, it helps a lot. You if still I, get panic if, attacks? Oh yeah. yeah oh yeah, too. it happens. It happens. Yeah. And you know, in that moment, I know that there's nothing happening outside of me. You know, I didn't break any law. I'm good. <laughs> I just have to breathe in. No one's gonna take me nowhere. Right. But it feels real. Right. But that's why good meditations, good training, uh, good art to keep busy, cleaning house, whatever we can do. But the important thing is to not feed on that story. It's so hard. Mm -hmm. It's so it's a hard, routine. right? It's a because, habit. Because you, when you're the story, right? It, it's not. It doesn't even have words. It just has life in your head, and it has words in your head. But there, but if you actually spoke the words or wrote those words down, it it would lose some of its power. But we don't like to do that, right? We like to just spin the story in our head. Well, this is what happened, and then this, and then then, and then you get to the end of the story, and then you start telling the story again. And it gets even worse this time and you spin it and spin it and spin it until it's like, oh my God, I can't even handle this. Yes, exactly. How do we stop? And, and, how do we stop talking to ourselves? But the important thing is that you cannot stop talking to yourself because you have just introduced the parasite mind. Mm -hmm. You know, one day I saw the movie called Beautiful Mind with my father. Mm -hmm. It's about a, a schizophrenic person who sees people. Well, anyways, you know, I invite people to see the, the movie. But after the whole journey of this character, I don't know if you see this movie. But I after the whole, the whole journey of this character, uh, the movie was over and my father says, how do you like the movie? I said, I, I liked it very much. And he said, well, the same way I look at him, I see you. And I took it personal. I go, dad, I don't see people who are not there. He goes, no, you don't see people who you're there, but you hear voices, your own voice, and you believe it. In that moment, he began giving me a training how to deal with that running horse mind because it's not real. It's just a voice of knowledge, like a fire that's burning in the forest. When it creates so much big, it has life of its own. So when we have life of its own here, we can totally get introduced the voice of knowledge, how we use the word against us. But in this moment, we have the power of what created the word. How about your dad? How does your dad, like, I mean, what is your dad's suffering like? What is his, you know, is he still alive? Yes. And yeah, uh, you know. the, the power of, of him is very, very interesting because he lived with the 16% of his heart capacity for like almost 10 years. Okay. And, and he said, you know, all my life, my body supported me. Now it's my time for my mind to support my body and being in pain doesn't give me the excuse to live in suffering. So I never see him complain. Even to the point that, you know, he's bleeding in stage with the cotton, he's still giving a speech. And uh, he's always been, you know, strong. And uh, one thing about him is that he doesn't, you know, give candy to the parasite mind. He tells you straight as it is. So people begin thinking before he comes in. So he lives in his integrity. And especially when he had the heart attack and he was in a coma for nine weeks, just to see him come out of that coma, give everybody how, what they wanted to learn from me because people were still searching. They were not even mindful of his body was broken, you know? They still see him as a guru, as a master, as a shaman that has all the answers, but. He was just in pain, giving everybody, making everybody know. He learned how to walk, how to talk, how to eat, and how, you know. And he said, you know, my body was full of morphine, but that gives me a, uh, the mind that I'm an addict. No, in the power of the mind can let everything go like this. It's the thing that we hold on to because we're addicted to suffering. So seeing him made me aware of my mastery of complaining because I complain and don't do and have all the justification, all the excuses, and they're good ones, until the point that he says, I still see you play like little kids, like you play with knowledge like they were toys. And then I begin thinking like an elder. And it's a lot of training, but at the same time, it's a beautiful thing to see everybody like they were just children, like my mother used to say. How did he get here? Where did this start for you guys as a family? Well, the more that we can go back for is a few generations, like think six. It was uh, my great great grandfather in uh, in the time of New Spain, Mexico. 
he was the first Mexican that, you know, that he saw he was from the hand of the king into the Mexican government. He was like all in that point. So he used to be an undertaker. Legends say that he lived until like 115 or 17, something like that. But he used to teach people in the cemetery in his neighborhood. Then he had a son and then his son carried the Nahuatl energy. And he was a musician, a military person. He found the gift of teaching through the music and uh, the, the language of the infinite. Then he had a daughter, is my grandmother, and she became a curandera What's in that? Mexico. It's a, a healer, and okay. uh, a healer from the old Mexico that integrated the indigenous and the Catholic into one. And, uh, and that's not how the society grew in Mexico. And then she made it to San Diego. And, and then is when my father left medicine and began studying with her after her car after his car accident in Barrio Logan in, in San Diego. And then what year was this? Probably 1984, 85. OK. Yes. And, and then uh, father learned how to speak English in 1988, 89. He was teaching. And by the year 1997, he published the, the four agreements. The four but before agreements. that, he just like began learning English, being um, passing the traditions. And uh, one of the things that my father loves to say is that when we speak about the Totec tradition, we're not speaking about 2,500 years of our ancestors. We're speaking of the Totecs of today, which it is it was what, that, what Totec means, artists of the spirit. The, and that's what you guys teach, the Totec tradition, yes? Yes. Um, and, that, and that's what you do for a living? Yes. Okay, how do people find you? Like, like how do... How do what tell me what the process is like a little bit so like like let's say i want to go on the, the the journey with you what what what's it like what are the steps like well the the the, the first thing before the before the, there was internet we just was word of mouth right <laughs> and with the word of mouth people started coming people started coming and 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 my dad got all these 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 things and he rejected them until he accepted one and then came the world of the internet and that's what how people he, he rejected learning. until he accepted well, he didn't want to put his work out there in a big global thing Got until it. he was ready to, until he felt it. And, uh, and this is when he said that the agreements were going to pass into many different languages and help a lot of people. But uh, the main thing that he did is that he, he used whatever helped him and took all the corruption, superstition from the Totec tradition that was meant, you know, for made, made, made with, uh, with time. And the thing is that it was going more for the power of creation and truth because all of this is created by the word. And, and you know, many traditions in the past didn't want to hear my dad at all because he was busting their bubble because you know, they were living in superstition, but who will be them without the superstition? But what happened is that the, the, the Totec work came in around the world. And one of my favorite things was to, when we were in France and we were in this cathedral, uh, giving a presentation, I, I said to my father, could you see if our ancestors see us now? And he said, he just smiled. Okay. <laughs> so it's not a big deal, but it's time. <laughs> right. Right. Um, man, I, I believe that everyone in the world has like a, a unique gift, a unique power that they give, you know, like there's something that like you call it medicine, right? What, what, what is yours? Like, what, what is, what is your gift that you give to the world that, that, that the world accepts and you go out there and do your thing? What, what is that well, gift? The gift that I want to present to the world is that they're the love of their life. And, you know, their loyalness belongs to them mm -hmm. and to not get interfere between what they have to give to the world, because it's the greatest gift when you create something. If it's your heart, your love, and you put it into the altar and then, you know, your life begins to change and you begin enjoying this dream because many people here don't enjoy this dream. And one of the big things for my tradition was the dream of machismo, the suppression of divine woman, the suppression of divine mother. And what happened was the one who hurt a lot was the people that I know that they were the one applying this machismo. No one wants to be around them. They're alone, you know, to be tough, to be hot. It, it wasn't, the, it was a curse. It's been a curse. So if I could give this to the little ones, because I know this affected me in my life. And, and I have the medicine to share everybody that they're the love of their life, that their voice is powerful. You know, I used to be this junkie in, uh, I used to be this junkie in, in, in then a year later in, in Tijuana, I was in the gutter, I was like in the neighborhood's junkie, you know, and, and then one year later, it was like a magical transformation. I was like in Malibu having dinner with Robert Downey Jr. like, like a crazy dream. And then, you know, I, and then I see the both dreams and then I go up 
And it's like I say to the little ones, no matter if the world sees you at juncture less than, you can always prevail and come up from darkness. And it's that you believe in you and no one can write the story for you. On the contrary, they will judge you, they put you down, but if you don't take them personal, they give you power. Like I said to my father the other day, I can't like to be judged. He goes, why son? It's because I take that into medicine and I, I have another way that the, the, the dream destroy us. So I have another tool to teach. Did you guys help Robert Downey Jr.? Well, it's not that we helped them a lot. It, it was just a, 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 a communion, you know? It's not that we helped each other. Is that was, that was this life that just met, we connected and go. I can say that he helped me too because we, we saw each other's eyes and, and right. his presence of where he has come from, from this world of, you know, artistic because everybody heard about his fault because he was sure. in gossip news, Famous. you know? Yeah. But no one heard my fault, but you know, it doesn't matter where you're it's at the in same life. fall, right. The poison will get you. Yeah. Um, man, uh, the last question I always like to ask my guests is, Look, this podcast isn't really going to, I mean, I, I feel silly asking you to, because I think, I mean, you, you don't even, you don't care, but a lot of guests, right? Like they want, you want something out of it. You want, you know, like, like a famous podcast, you go on a famous podcast because it will blow you up, right? It will make you, it will put you out in the world more. My podcast just isn't that big. So why, why, why take your time? You know, because it, it, you know, it might not really do that much for you. So why take your time? Come on here, talk to me for 45 minutes to an hour. Like, why do this? Why do, why do you do this? Well, every invitation is like someone is offering you the table and food on the table. When someone offers you a gift of love, you take action. And the gift of love that is it, been at the table, the conversation that happened at the table will help many people that you don't have no idea. And the thing is that we show up. And when we show up, we're just gratitude because it's not that we're saying about who famous or not famous because in reality, it does not matter is who's in service because we both of us work for the same boss. Like you said, we both touch suffering and we both work with the same boss to eliminate the suffering wherever we come from. So I just, I'm full of gratitude because when you give me this offering, I say yes, because you know, you offer me. <laughs> well, man, I appreciate it. Uh, man, if I want to work with you, if anybody wants to work with you, what are, what are the steps to take to do that? Well, first of all, is the commitment that you want to work with yourself because we just give all these tools as a reflection, but the one who's going to be working on themselves is themselves. And this is when we hear the call, the moment that you hear your call, we're there to help. And the thing that we say, you know, we're here for everybody, no matter what walk of life you walk in, you know, we've been working with ourselves in many different traditions from the Mormon tradition, from Islam tradition. We, we found many different people who come because it's not about religion, it's about bettering ourselves. And uh, when you're ready to better yourself, you know, the, the, the teacher or the words will come into point. But uh, in this beautiful thing, you know, the beautiful thing is that there's books, there's um, internet, there's YouTube that you can hear the books for free being, being played that people share. I, I love when that happens. And um, the beautiful thing is that we're there. Just one thing is like this, you know, if you want to go listen to a good music, you go to the ticket master and you get your ticket and you show up and you're ready. And if it's general admission, you get there early and your first right hand, but it's a determination, you know? <laughs> yeah, man. I like it. Uh, Jose, thank you so much for coming on. I appreciate it. Um, uh, I, like I said, I loved your, I love your dad's book to the, to the point where, I mean, even as we all mess it up, right? Like I, I, I'm in no, I'm in no way perfect and in no way do I, hold true every day to these four agreements that I that I agree to every morning. But I do wake up and I do agree to them every single day. You know, yeah. every every single day of my life, I, I repeat them. Um, and uh, it's to it's because of your family. So man, wow. from me to you, thank you so much. I oh, thank you, brother. And, and like you were saying, you just reminded me when you were speaking, I just imagine, you know, this is how we all learn to walk. Yeah, we stand up before we stand up before but the determination one day, we're not gonna be able to admit when we're running. Right. We won't even know it. Yeah. Yeah. So, man, thank you so much, guys. As thank always, uh, don't go out in the world and try to be Jose. Jose is, is his unique individual person. Um, don't go out in the world and try to be me. I have my unique and individual power as well. So you go out in the world, everybody, and you find your own power.